continue our study of God's outline of history. And we're studying the difficult transition that took place recorded in the book of Acts from the age of law to the age of grace. And we saw last week the very great difficulty that the early Christians had in letting go of the traditions they had been taught in the age of law and embracing the new, uh, the new age of grace. That which characterizes this age is succinctly stated in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, where it says, literally, For the old sin nature shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. In other words, the victory that is offered to us today is far and away more achievable and is far greater than was available to those in past ages. So we now come to another very difficult transition that had to take place when we came from the age of law where God's spotlight was on one people, the Jew, and now his spotlight is on the Gentiles. When we came from the age of law to the, to the age of grace as a principle for living for God. And that transition is from the way the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Covenant to the way the Holy Spirit works in the New Covenant. And there were extraordinary things that took place recorded in the book of Acts to introduce these new ministries of the Holy Spirit and to bring people to understand what is now available to them. Now, I'm going to divide the new ministries of the Spirit into three categories. So you might jot these down. Usually there is a little page inside your bulletin you can take notes on. But I think it's important to show there are, th there are three distinct ways in which the Holy Spirit ministers these new ministries. The first category we'll call the salvation work of the Holy Spirit. The second category is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the third category is the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now each one of these categories are different. The saving work of the Holy Spirit takes place once and for all, the moment of salvation. What is done there is forever. And we cannot merit this work of the Holy Spirit at salvation. We don't deserve it. We can't improve upon it by faithfulness or working for God. And we can't lose these saving ministries of the Holy Spirit by sin as a Christian. So these are unique things. Now the gifts of the Holy Spirit are those God-given abilities that he gives each Christian to enable you to fulfill his plan for your life in his, in his kingdom. Each believer is given at least one spiritual gift, one supernatural ability. And this means that you are equipped to accomplish things that God has. And these gifts, these abilities are above human talents. They are abilities that God gives us to enable us to further his plan for our life. Now, if you want to find out what God's plan for your life is, the first thing you need to find out is what are the gifts he's given you because they always are along the line of what he wants to do with your life. God plans your life. He planned it before the worlds were created. He had a plan for your life. And he 
elected to give you those gifts before the world was created. When you believe, you're given these gifts. You discover your spiritual gift as you grow in Christ, much the same as when you're born physically, you inherit certain uh, abilities, certain talents from your forefathers. And these talents begin to come out as you grow physically, same way spiritually. You begin to discover your spiritual gift as you seek the Lord and you grow in Christ. Now, these spiritual gifts not only are given to each believer at the moment of salvation, but they cannot be lost. Sin in the Christian life does not cause you to lose these gifts. Romans 11, verse 29, tells us very clearly two things. Number one, that the gift is connected with the calling for your life. And number two, that they are permanent. It says, for the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. That means they are not taken away. As I've, I've seen Christian ministers that I know are out of fellowship still operate their spiritual gift and it still works. It's a dangerous thing because when you use a spiritual gift that God has given you out of fellowship with God, instead of, instead of bringing glory to God as your motive, your motive becomes bringing glory to yourself. That's very dangerous. But God still operates the gift because it's permanent. Our goal is to seek to walk in fellowship with the Lord, growing in Christ, and to use those spiritual abilities that he's given us in serving God. Now, the third category is different than the first two categories. The first two categories you receive from God something at the moment of salvation, and it operates throughout your Christian life. You have spiritual gifts as long as you're in this world. The filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, however, is something that does not occur at the moment of salvation. You are only filled with the Holy Spirit and He produces fruits in and through you when you come to realize you can't serve the Lord by your own strength and your own human wisdom. It's only when you come to realize that and you discover in the Word of God that it says that every believer has the Holy Spirit living in him in order to be a, for him to depend on the Holy Spirit so that he can work in and through you. Only those who are surrendered to Christ and want his will in their life and at that moment, believe God and depend upon the Holy Spirit to, to empower him and guide him or fill with the Holy Spirit. And when you deliberately sin, that is, when you knowingly sin, that filling ministry of the Holy Spirit is interrupted. It's interrupted until you confess your sins, as 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That moment, you can depend on the Holy Spirit again. So a person is not always filled with the Holy Spirit. It's up to our will. Do we want to be filled with the Spirit? Do we choose to depend by faith upon the Holy Spirit and not upon our own human wisdom and strength? So it's a choice involved. With gifts, there's no choice involved. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says the Holy Spirit distributes these gifts sovereignly as he wills. So it's not your will, it's his. And that's why it's always very distressing to me to see certain meetings where they give the altar call for people to come forward and to, and to pray through for receiving certain gifts. If God has not given you one, you're not going to get it. 
You may get something else, but you're not going to get God's gift. Because you're equipped with that gift from salvation. It just remains for you to seek it and to find it, to discover what your gifts are. So it's very distressing for me to find uh, meetings where they will call people forward and, and uh, the, the modern thing right now, there's a certain movement within the vineyard where they're having everybody come forward and seek the gift of profit as if that's something you can get by seeking and claiming and earning and meriting. That's not something you can have by that. There's another spirit that will give you a facsimile of it, but I don't want it. I don't want anything that's not from the Holy Spirit. And you see others have meetings where you come, you're called to come forward to claim the gift of what is called tongues. I've always found that one tongue is enough for me. It gets me in enough trouble. Uh, let's correctly translate that. It is a gift. We're going to talk a little bit about it this morning. There is a gift that's falsely called the gift of tongues. It should be the gift of languages. That's what the Greek word really would be translated into English by. The gift of languages. Yes, there is that gift. And yes, God does give it. But I don't believe that it's something outside of the normal operation of the Holy Spirit wherein he gives us gifts. I believe that, you, that some are given that gift and it becomes apparent later on. And uh, yet that seems to be the gift that has caused more trouble and confusion than any other gift. So the very least I can say about it is that if you think you've got that gift, you better test it to make sure it's from God. It's easily duplicated by false spirits. Now, these then are the three categories of the new covenant ministries of the Spirit. There are the salvation works of the Spirit, once and for all, the moment of salvation. There are the gifts of the Spirit, given at the moment of salvation, but discovered as you grow in Christ. There are the fruits of the Spirit through His filling ministry that must be claimed by faith. It's not automatic at all. It's something that we must claim by faith. Now, let's look at the transition into these ministries. I'm going to list the, the new salvation works of the Spirit, our possessions. There is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to take these up next week in detail. But just to, just to identify them, the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit immerses us into the spirit, spiritual realm. And at that moment, He takes us, the Holy Spirit takes us, and baptizes us into union with Christ himself so that we become a member of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. He, in the baptizing work, creates this mystical union that exists between every believer and Jesus Christ. So much so that the scripture speaks of, the, of whatever touches you as a believer as also touching Christ. In one terrible situation that existed in Corinth, a very sinful city in the old Roman Empire, the Corinthians, there were a, a number of men in the Corinthian church who had gone back to the old religion, which was the worship of Aphrodite, the goddess of lust. I won't call it love. And Aphrodite had a temple that dominated the whole view of Corinth. It was up on a big hill. It's still there. You can see the ruins of the temple of Aphrodite when you're in Corinth. And uh, there were at least a thousand 
temple priestess who were kept uh, on duty at the temple at all times. Of course, they were just religious prostitutes. And some of the men in the Corinthian church had gone back to the old religion. And they were having relations with the temple prostitutes. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, God says, Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and join them to a prostitute or whore? And he says, God forbid. He said, for don't you know that God says the two shall become one? Therefore, shall I make the member of Christ a member of a prostitute? Now, there's some profound truth in that rebuke. First of all, he doesn't say stop the relationship or you'll be cut out of the body of Christ. He says stop it because of what you're doing. It's a terrible thing. And he goes back to Genesis as far as sexual intercourse is concerned. Sexual intercourse makes you one with the person you have sexual intercourse with. And he says, when you have sexual relations with a prostitute, you're making yourself one with her. But he says, the enormity of the sin for the Christian is that you're already one with Christ. So if you make yourself one with a prostitute, you're making Christ one with her because he is part of you. Now that is why the Holy Spirit says every other sin we commit is a part from the body. But he who commits fornication involves his own body. In other words, there is a great reality here we can't get away from. And so he says, therefore, stop it. And then he goes on to say that your body is also, the, not only is your body a member of Christ, but it's also the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he says, shall I bring the Holy Spirit into be involved with this situation? And he says, on that basis, stop it. In either case, he says, don't stop it, because if you don't, you will lose your relation to the body of Christ, you'll be cut out of it. He doesn't say stop or the Holy Spirit will leave you. No, he says stop because these things are true and they continue to be true. So that is a tremendous lesson in 1 Corinthians 6 and a great impetus to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that act whereby he puts, he, he takes us to himself and he puts us into union with Christ. Then there's the indwelling of the Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit taking permanent residence in us the moment that we receive Jesus Christ as Savior. He takes up permanent residence in us and the scripture says he doesn't leave. Jesus says in Hebrews chapter 13, he's in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. He says, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. And that is such a comfort. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is the third salvation work of the new covenant. And this is that ministry of the Spirit whereby he becomes God's guarantee that we are redeemed, that we're going to be brought into his presence. And uh, it is the presence of the Holy Spirit in us that constitutes the seal itself. Is God's signet ring guarantee. The word means the signet ring whereby you would sign something and it made it your possession. He says, he is my guarantee that you will be delivered in a resurrection body into my presence. So those are unique to this age. Along with the gifts and the filling ministry, they're unique to this age. And we'll take them up in more detail next time. There's also the regeneration of the Spirit where he...
gives us the new birth. He gives us eternal spiritual life the moment we believe in Christ. But that has been in every age. That's not unique to this age. So that's the saving work of the Spirit. Now let's look at the transition that took place in the book of Acts. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. The initial giving of these new covenant ministries is recorded in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they appeared, there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves. They rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. They began to speak with other languages, literally, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now in verse 4, we know that these ministries had begun. There are two categories of ministries that are mentioned there. First, it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that is the ministry that is available only to those who believe God, who are convinced that they need to depend on the Holy Spirit to serve Him, and are already dedicated to Him. And they all received the filling of the Spirit. By the way, how many were here at that time? Acts chapter 1, it says there were 120 people who were in that room, upper room, waiting for the promise that Jesus had given them. Verse 15, Acts 1, 15, it says, This time Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons was there together and said, You see, it was 120 people who kept waiting in the upper room for the promise that Jesus had made them. And there was something unique about this situation. First of all, they were all believers. They're old covenant believers, didn't have the new ministries of the Holy Spirit yet, but they were all believers. Secondly, they had a pretty good teacher. They've been believers for at least about three years. They had a pretty fair teacher, Jesus Christ. So they were well instructed, well motivated. Third, there were many other Old Covenant believers at that time, but these were the ones who were really believing God and waiting for the promise that Jesus had made them. And so they were dedicated, they were believing God. Fourth, they all had been called to a ministry and they knew it and they were ready for it. So when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were immediately filled with the Holy Spirit because they were ready for it. This is not the normal experience today. When you come to, to believe in Jesus Christ, you haven't learned all that you need to learn yet about being filled with the Holy Spirit. You haven't gone through the frustrating experience of trying to live for God by your own human strength and intelligence. So you're not convinced you really need the Holy Spirit to fill and empower you yet. These people already were. So it was a unique situation. So the filling of ministry of this Spirit was immediately made available to them. Secondly, the gifts of the Spirit. We know that they receive gifts because they all receive one particular gift in order to be an outward sign of what had taken place on the inside. And in order to be able to identify with others who would be brought into these new covenant ministries. So this was the initial transition here. They all were given the gift of languages. And it goes on to show that apparently there were among them different ones were given different languages. Because there were people from Parthia, Media, 
the Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, the Coptic of Egyptians, uh, Libya, Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. So you, they were from all over the place, and these people were given the gift of language that represented all of these people who were present. But it doesn't mention all of the ministries of the Spirit. We simply know that uh, these outward ones were given. Now, there had been a particular prophecy about what the Holy Spirit would do when he was given in the New Covenant ministries. One of those prophecies was about the baptizing with the Holy Spirit. It's recorded in all four Gospels. It's recorded, it's so important that it's recorded in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, Mark chapter 1, verse 8, Luke chapter 3, verse 16, and John chapter 1, verse 33. We'll just take one of those prophecies, they're all basically the same, and look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John the Baptist, announcing the soon coming of the Lord, says this, As for me, I baptize you with water, literally because of repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with, number one, the Holy Spirit, and number two, fire. So there are three different baptisms in this verse. First, there's the baptism of John the Baptist, which was done with water. But he says Jesus is going to baptize with both the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, it's interesting that he names two different baptisms Jesus effects that describe the two different comings of Christ. In the first coming, Jesus sets forth and instigates the baptism of the Holy Spirit to each believer. In the second coming, he's going to baptize all unbelievers in fire. And the process is described in the next verse. The baptism with fire is, is de defined in the next verse, verse 12. He said, and his winnowing fork is in his hand. He will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You see, he's describing the baptism with fire. Every person hearing this in that agricultural economy understood exactly what he was saying. This was, he's describing something that they did every harvest. See, in those days, they had primitive ways of separating chaff of uh, chaff from the wheat. And so what they would do is very effective. They would just uh, make large piles of wheat in a place, usually on a little mountain or a little hill where it was windy or in a, a gorge or a, a place where the wind would blow. They would leave this wheat there until it dried out thoroughly in the sun. Now when wheat dries, the, the chaff the, the covering of the kernel becomes brittle and flaky. And so then once it was dried, they would build a large fire downwind. And a person would just get in the pile of wheat with a winnowing fork, it was really like a snow shovel, and they would take and throw the wheat up into the air. The chaff is very light. It blows with the wind. It would blow off as you throw it in the air and it would blow into the fire. The wheat, which is heavy, would fall back to the ground. They would just keep quit pit pitching the wheat into the air until all the chaff was blown away into the fire. And that's what he says is going to happen in his second coming. The baptism of fire will take all of those who have rejected the gift of pardon that Jesus died to make free to people and he's going to cast them in a judgment into fire. 
So that's the baptism with fire. No water involved, it's fire. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is predicted in every gospel. And now let's turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, verse 4. And, he, and gathering them together, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of me. Now that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, he says, For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he says, what had been promised and predicted in the Gospels is now going to take place in a few days. So he tells them, look, stay here in Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 24, he put it beautifully. He said, but you are to wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. And so some of them took him serious and believed him and waited. So Acts chapter 2 records how the Holy Spirit came, but it doesn't mention the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now we have to go over to Acts chapter 11 to catch where it's mentioned. Acts chapter 11. Now uh, this is uh, sometime later. It's at least a year or two later. And Peter has gone to Gentiles. He's the first of the apostles who has actually gone to Gentiles and preached the gospel. And when he did, they all believed, everyone who was waiting in the, in the house of this Roman centurion named Cornelius in Caesarea, everyone who was there believed the moment he gave the gospel. And the moment they believed, it says, they, the Holy Spirit came upon all of them and they began to speak in other languages. Now the apostles in Jerusalem were all upset with this. You see, they, as we saw last time, they were so steeped in the traditions of false Judaism that they had the idea that you couldn't talk to Gentiles, even give them the gospel. And so they called Peter in and they were, uh, he was in trouble with them. He had to clarify why he did this. And this is part of his defense. Now look what he says in verse 15. He said, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. Now when was that? The day of Pentecost. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now you see, he identifies both the house of Cornelius incident and the day of Pentecost as the fulfillment of that. So he says the baptism of the Holy Spirit took place in the beginning in the day of Pentecost and it also took place at the house of Cornelius. He shows that there had been a staged transition and that's very, very important. God followed a certain order, as he always does, a certain order of introducing these new covenant ministries of the Holy Spirit. Who had been his covenant people upon whom the spotlight of his favor had rested in the old covenant? The Jew. That's why it says, uh, Paul says in Romans, that he preached the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. It's because they were the ones that had the covenant relationship and were the client people of the Lord in the old covenant, the other age. And so he says that the transition took place then first with the Jew. But there was a problem because there, were, there was a group of people called the Samaritans who clung to be Jewish, but they were half-breeds. They were greatly mixed with Gentiles, but they still were Jews. They still had Jewish blood. And so we find an extraordinary introduction of the ministries of the Holy Spirit to them in Acts chapter 8. So I want to show how the trans operation transition, I call it, how operation transition took place 
And in this transition, the Holy Spirit was given initially to each group of people. And then thereafter, for instance, in Acts chapter 2, after the initial giving of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, the new ministries, it says that Peter preached and uh, some 5,000 people believed. Now, it doesn't say that there was, you know, any extraordinary outward sign of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. But apparently, the moment they believed, because the transition had already taken place to the Jews, the moment the Jew believed, the Holy Spirit was given in his full New Covenant ministries. Now, in Acts chapter 8, Philip, one of the first deacons of the church went down to Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the multitudes with, it's verse 5 and, and then verse 6 in chapter 8. And the multitudes with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. Well, that would freak people out today, wouldn't it? Cast a demon out of somebody and it comes out screaming. It still happens, by the way. Verse 8, And there was much rejoicing in the city. Now, look at verse 14. Now, when the, the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them that had simply been baptized. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So here is a case where the people had already believed through Philip. And it wasn't until the apostles came down, and the most important one was Peter, came down and laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, the problem is, people still try to make that the norm today. This was an extraordinary transitional thing. I'll show in a moment, that's not the way it's done today. And it makes me so grieved when I see pastors calling people to come forward to receive the Holy Spirit, and they lay hands on them, usually saying it will be evidenced by your speaking in another language, or some, they don't even do that. I wish they would at least say a language. Usually it's some gibberish. You'll have some ecstatic experience. This is not to be the norm, as we'll see. This was a special introduction of the New Covenant ministries to the Samaritans who were part Jew. After this took place and the Holy Spirit was, the new ministries of the kingdom of the new kingdom were introduced, I believe that after Samaritans believed they received the Holy Spirit when they believed thereafter this introduction. This was Operation Transition. Now, There is one other important thing. Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven to who? Peter. What does a key do? It opens the door. And that's what Peter had just done with the Samaritans. Peter had already opened the door. Who was preaching on the day of Pentecost? Peter. He had already opened the door to the Jews. He opened the door to the Samaritans here. And then in Acts chapter 10, who is it that first preaches to the Gentiles? Peter. You see, he used the keys to introduce the Gentiles into the new covenant ministries of the Holy Spirit. And let's look at that occasion. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 43 now. Of him, Jesus... Uh, uh, Peter is speaking of Jesus to this group of Gentiles. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him 
receives forgiveness of sin. Now that's a wonderful, concise statement of the good news right there. He says, of Jesus, about Jesus, all the prophets bear witness. So there you have the evidence that the prophets had predicted these things and they were fulfilled in Jesus. And he says, that through his name, everyone who believes in him, there's the good news, to believe in Jesus as your Savior having died for you, receives forgiveness of sin. So faith alone in Jesus Christ, you receive forgiveness of sins. So there was the, the gospel in a nutshell, about as concisely as you could put it. And the minute Peter said that, look what happened. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. You see, the moment he gave the good news, they believed it. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. He didn't lay his hands on them. He didn't do anything. They just believed and whammo, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And it says, all of the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with languages and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse water to these, for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? Now that explains all kinds of things. First of all, he says, they've already received the Holy Spirit. Now only a believer can receive the Holy Spirit. And the sequence here is infinitely important. They believe they instantly receive the Holy Spirit. Then Peter says, can anyone spare some water so that we can baptize these who have what? Already received the Holy Spirit. Now that solves the heresy of saying that you have to be baptized with water to be saved. You see, they've already received the Holy Spirit, which means they're already saved. And they're going to be baptized with water because they're already saved as an act of testimony to God that they believe that they've been put into Christ. You see, there's the proper order. First the gospel, then you believe you're saved. After that, you're baptized in water as a testimony to God of your faith. Now, that's what, G, uh, what uh, Peter recounts in the next chapter when he says they were baptized with the Holy Spirit just as we were at the beginning. Now, with Acts chapter 10, we have the end of Operation Transition. The New Covenant ministries of the Holy Spirit had been introduced first to the Jews, then to those who were part Jew, then to those who were not Jew at all, the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. From that time on, the norm has been that you receive all of the ministries of the Spirit at the moment you are saved. Now you say, how can you prove that? Yes, I can prove it. We'll see it in another problem that we'll look at now in just a moment. Turn to Acts chapter 19. Now let me describe the problem that they had. There was a unique situation in the first generation of the Christian era. When John the Baptist ministered, he brought tens of thousands of people to faith in Jesus as their Messiah and Savior. When Jesus ministered, he brought tens of thousands of people to believe in him. So that means there were countless thousands of old covenant believers. See, this was before the day of Pentecost, so they were still old covenant believers. And then on the day of Pentecost, you start with the first fruits of the New Covenant ministries of the Holy Spirit, the New Covenant believers. So you had living at the same time 
thousands of Old Covenant believers alongside of New Covenant believers. Now this situation could not happen after the first generation. But it presented a problem. That is what we call, or what I call, Operation Integration. Integrating Old Covenant believers into the New Covenant. Here is a case that must have been repeated hundreds of, if not thousands of times. Acts chapter 9, 19, verse 1. It came about while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper country, came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Now here is Ephesus, at least 1,500 miles from Jerusalem, and that's a fur piece in those days. Ephesus was a beautiful city, probably second only to Rome in beauty. I can't wait to go back and see it in October when I take the tour there. And one of the most beautiful ruins. You can still see what grandeur Ephesus must have had. It was rich, it was influential, it was uh, cultured, and uh, it was a, uh, a hot spot for travel. And so when Paul comes to this Gentile center, he finds disciples who are believers. And so he did what apparently every Believer did in those days when they would find new believers in a far-flung place in the Roman Empire. He gives them a test in pneumatology. Now, to you, that means the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So he asked the question. I want you to notice every word in this question because it answers a lot of things. Every word. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, underline that word when about three times. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, why did he ask the question? Find out whether they were Old Covenant or New Covenant believers. If they were New Covenant believers, what would be true of them? They would have received the Holy Spirit when they believed along with all of his ministries. Now, why does he ask that question at this time? He didn't ask the Samaritans that. Why did he ask it here? Because it's obvious that Operation Transition is over, and he knew it. After Operation Transition was over in Acts chapter 10, the normal experience of every person who believed was to receive the Holy Spirit with all of the new ministries when they believed. Now, they give a rather good idea of where they were by their answer. They said, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So they answered it. They were spiritually dense. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. So they were converts of John the Baptist or converts of some of his disciples. And, Paul's, uh, and Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is Jesus. You see, that was the message in the Old Covenant, to believe in the Messiah who's coming the one who is coming to fulfill the animal sacrifices, to do what they could never do. The animal sacrifices cover sin on a temporary basis until the Messiah comes, the ultimate sacrifice, and takes sin away. They were told to believe in him who was coming. And their salvation was based on God's great charge account. God saved them on a charge account that, established, that was established until Jesus came and paid. And when, and verse 4, and Paul said, John's baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who is coming after him, that is in Jesus. And when they heard this,
They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with languages and prophesying. So they got two gifts that immediately were made known. They were both, they received both uh, the gift of languages and a prophet. And it says they were in all about 12 men. So it wasn't a great number, but there were 12 Old Covenant believers who are now integrated into the New Covenant. And they received the same sign as was given in the beginning in order to show that it was consistent, that they had been integrated into the New Covenant ministries of the Holy Spirit. Now, once that integration in the first century was over, this is no longer the norm for Christians. The norm today is you receive it when you believe. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. In him, that is in Jesus, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, the praise of his glory. Now, this is a wonderful verse. You see, as a consequence of believing, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean in order of time. It, it shows in order of cause. The cause of being sealed was you believed. And when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is God's guarantee that you belong to him, that you're purchased, and it's with you to the, to the time you're redeemed as God's own possession. Your body will be redeemed in a resurrection body. And so it shows that the Holy Spirit today is given when you believe. Romans 8 verse 9 shows that you can't be a believer without having the Holy Spirit. Absence of the Holy Spirit means you're not a believer. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 it says, however you're not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So this shows that you can't be a Christian without having the Holy Spirit. Now, all of this is of tremendous importance. I remember going through this with a dear, charismatic brother that I love very much. And when I went through it with him, he says, how it would take a Chinese lawyer to understand that and to figure that out. He said, why in the world did you ever come up with such a thing? I'll tell you, brother, I, I said, I'll tell you. Because if you figure it any other way, it contradicts the New Testament epistles, which are God's divine interpretation of the history in the Gospels and the book of Acts. And the first principle of interpreting the Scripture is that Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. So if you come up with an understanding of something that contradicts something in another part, then you're wrong. The reason I came up with this, as others have, but the reason I went through and came up with this is because I started out with the premise, Scripture cannot contradict itself. If we do what I've seen so many charismatics practice, almost universal, having people come forward to receive the Holy Spirit, laying hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit after they're saved. That contradicts what Paul said in Acts 19, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? It contradicts Romans 8 verse 9, which says you can't even be a believer if you don't have the Holy Spirit. It contradicts Ephesians 1 13, which says you re after you believed, you received. And it doesn't mean uh, some later time the two aorist tense verbs being simultaneous action. The sequence is of cause, not of time. 
And so it says, after you believed, you received the Holy Spirit of promise, which is given as a seal of your redemption. And so anyone who calls someone forward to receive a gift of the Spirit by the laying on of hands or by seeking or something like that, or to receive the Holy Spirit, which is even worse, is absolutely wrong. And yet, human nature has not changed. We saw last week how difficult it was even for the apostles to let go of the traditions they had been taught, even when faced with the direct statements of Jesus himself, which they had heard with their own ears. He told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And when two years after that, Jesus, or, or Peter went to preach to the Gentiles, what did they do? They brought him in and bawled him out for it. Why? because it contradicted their traditions. And so that's the big problem we've got with this. Many people have been brought up in Pentecostal churches. They've been brought up in, uh, they've been brought up in charismatic churches. And I'm thankful for them because they're, they're faithful to the Word of God. They hold to the gospel and so forth. But when it comes to the ministries of the Holy Spirit, they have been taught certain things from their early days in the church that contradict the epistles, and when you face them with that, they cling to their traditions rather than the Word of God. And this is very lamentable. It's very sad. Whenever we come up against something like this, Either we believe the Word of God or we don't. If you are clinging to something you were taught and you say, Oh, but dear brother so-and-so was such a saintly man and he believed this. Well, dear brother so-and-so was saintly wrong. <laughs> One of the big problems we have today is we forget a principle of, of interpretation that Martin Luther brought out. And that is, we must interpret obscure passages of, of Scripture by the many clear statements of Scripture on the same subject. In other words, if you try to, and, and the reverse is what many people do. Every cult, every false doctrine that I've ever run into was brought about by taking an obscure passage and making that the chief passage on it and interpreting all the clear passages that that contradict it by this one obscure passage, every one of them. And if you do that, you're in a jungle of confusion. The, the, and one of the big problems is people try to interpret the epistles by the book of Acts. The book of Acts, it faithfully records what happened. It does not attempt to interpret in any in-depth way the meaning of what happened. You have to go to the epistles, which are God's divine interpretation of the meaning of what happened in the book of Acts and in the Gospels. If you reverse that, you're in big trouble. This is why I took the time, prayer, agonizing, studying to find out what was going on here. What I have laid out before you is a bit complex, but it does not contradict any passage of Scripture. It fits. Operation Transition explains the unusual things that were going on when the ministries of the Spirit were first introduced. Operation Transition explains what happened to the Old Covenant believers when they were integrated into the New Covenant. It doesn't contradict what the epistles say. Because, you see, the epistles were written after all of this had taken place. The epistles were written to explain what is the norm for us today. And I pray that you will remember this, that you will ponder it, that you will learn it. Because I think the number one way Satan's coming into the church today is through the teachings on the Holy Spirit. The number one way, the moment 
we cling to something that we've been taught that contradicts clear statements of Scripture. We cling to this as a denomination. We cling to this as an individual. The moment we do, we open the door for Satan to get in with all kinds of false teaching and, more importantly, false experiences. Don't be deceived. But more importantly, learn what is true. Because when you learn what is true, you find that we'll talk about next week. You find these unique new ministries of the Spirit equip you with power for real things. Not to get people to speak in some gibberish or to fall on their face, but to bring them to Christ and to build them up in Christ. That's what we need. We need that kind of power.